Over the last decade, Donald Trump and his surrogates have been conditioning the Republican Party's base to believe that democracy is no longer tenable. They believe that the last election was stolen and they don't think that a fair election can even be conducted. And little by little, they've been warming up the American people, specifically Trump's base, to this prospect of Trump potentially being a dictator as a way to save America. And some of them are pretty implicit about the way that they sell this to people. Others, not so much. Case in point. I want to know why what happened in Minamar can't happen here. No reason. I mean, it, it should happen here. No reason. But that's right. Welcome to the end of democracy. <laughs> we're here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6th, but we will we, we will endeavor to, forget, oh, oh, oh. to get rid of it and replace it with, with this right here. We'll replace it with this right, right here. Amen. That's right, because all glory, all glory is not to government, all glory to God. Yeah, so that's pretty alarming. But as they become increasingly authoritarian, the tolerance among the base for draconian policies has increased as well. And it's not just Trump supporters who support this. For example, a PRRI poll found that 47% of the country supports Trump rounding up undocumented immigrants and putting them in militarized camps. Now, if you look at the numbers, the Republican Party in particular supports this overwhelmingly at 79%. But still, you see widespread support among the American population, which is a big red flag. And it's terrifying because this would affect one in 25 American households because that's how big the number of undocumented immigrants are. There are households with mixed immigration statuses. And in order to actually pull this off, it would require a massive Gestapo-like police force where they go door to door to track down all of the immigrants that Trump wants to get rid of. And it's not just going to be undocumented immigrants because he's already vocalized his intent to deport legal immigrants like the Haitian immigrants and perhaps anyone who's perceived to be immigrant. People who are black and brown might also get swept up in this. And to do something like this, to get all the immigrants out of the country, he would have to incentivize Americans turning over fellow Americans, anyone who they suspect of being non-citizens. It would create a culture of paranoia and induce widespread panic, and the people who are turned over would have to be placed in some sort of specialized camps because our jails simply can't hold that much people. We're talking 13 to 14 million people. Now, John Oliver made the point that there's less than 2 million people in total in our federal prisons, and we are the most incarcerated country on earth. So in order to hold six times as many people, you would have to create something entirely new, i.e. concentration camps. And those camps with that many people would be rife with abuse. Proper sanitation would be almost impossible to maintain. Dispersing food and water for that many people would be a logistical nightmare. Many of them would go hungry, and the conditions would likely leave them permanently traumatized for life if they're lucky enough to survive. Yet, half the country supports that, 47%. Now, when one Republican influencer was confronted with the cruel reality of a policy like that, he was fine with it. So Mark Cuban polled his Twitter audience about a hypothetical undocumented grandmother who's lived in the country for decades and has children and grandchildren here. The question is, what do you do to somebody like that if you support mass deportation? And right wing influencer Jesse Kelly responded, saying, kick in her door in the middle of the night, put her in handcuffs, and send her and her kids back to where she was born. And do it on camera as a warning to anyone who thinks they can violate the sovereignty of my country without consequences. Now, he wasn't an outlier. In fact, most of the replies were as harsh, if not more harsh, also saying that her children and grandchildren, who are citizens, mind you, should also be deported with her. So we've reached a point where one of two parties is enthusiastically supporting an explicitly fascistic Hitler-like policy, and nearly half the country finds it acceptable. One side is cheering it on, the other side is like, yeah, I guess I support that. I mean, how many of our friends and family agree with this too? How enthusiastic are they about this policy? It gets worse though, because ABC News and Ipsos asked registered voters which of the two candidates between Kamala and Trump are fascist, if any, and a plurality of them correctly identified Donald Trump as a fascist at 44%. But here's where it gets really alarming. 
8% of the registered voters who correctly identify Donald Trump as a fascist are his own supporters. Stop for a moment and let that sink in. His own supporters are saying, yeah, that guy's a fascist. They know he's a fascist. And they're still choosing to support him anyway. But it's not just like they know he's a fascist and they're supporting him despite his fascism. Some of them are supporting him because of his fascism. Now, I already knew that not all Trump supporters were as ignorant as people like to make it seem because I've had family members who support Donald Trump tell me that they know Trump would destroy the country and that's why they're voting for him because they don't think that America is redeemable. So starting from scratch is the best way to go. Now, the people in this poll probably weren't as direct as that family member who I talked to, but they basically acknowledged that Trump was a fascist, but made it clear that they kind of like that. Here's what they told ABC News, quote, I don't like him as the person that he chose to be, but I like his politics, she said. But as a human being, I would never support. When asked about an authoritarian leader, she said, I think it's good for the country. I think we need some sort of order. I do like those kinds of things from Trump. She said, while people deserve freedom, a balance is necessary and society demands certain rules to be implemented. Now, this is a 46-year-old woman who's a former Democrat now leaning towards Trump. Another former Democrat says, personally, He's a fascist, she said. Professionally wise, as president, I think he would do a good job. We can call our bosses fascist. Doesn't mean that they're not good bosses, she said. Mm, except when you call your boss a fascist, you usually don't mean it in a good way. She also said she would be fine with Trump imposing an authoritarian government, arguing that somebody needs to impose some type of leadership. Very interesting. Now, there's this 21-year-old self-described moderate saying fascism isn't disqualifying, telling ABC News, it's something that I'm kind of having to look past, he said. I don't necessarily want to, but considering the candidates we have, I feel like it's something I kind of have to do. Now, finally, there's this person, 42-year-old Mindy from North Carolina, who told ABC News, Trump definitely fits the definition of a fascist and responded affirmatively when asked if she supported authoritarian leadership. Now, ironically, that same person also supports abortion rights and doesn't agree with Trump on abortion, but she's supporting him to her own detriment because she really likes the prospect of him becoming a dictator. This needs to be a wake-up call to all of the liberals and leftists watching who are still in denial or who still have cognitive dissonance about the reality of the Republican Party in 2024. These people know what they're getting us all into. They're going into this with eyes wide open. This is why the democracy argument hasn't worked because when you tell them Trump is a threat to democracy, well, they see that as a selling point. They like Trump's authoritarianism. They know he's an authoritarian and that's why many of them are supporting him. And to the rest of them who don't necessarily support Trump as a dictator, well, they do like his fascistic policies, like mass deportation. So perhaps they'll support him despite his dictatorial ambitions because they like his Hitlerian policies. And listen, it was clear from the get-go that Trump was a wannabe dictator. If you go back to my videos from 2015, 2016, I was calling him a proto-fascist way back then. But at that time, you can still make an excuse for a lot of people. I think that most of the country didn't see him that way because they're not as savvy of, as people like you and myself who follow politics really closely. But in 2024, you can't make that excuse. It is an entirely different story. They watched him try to overthrow the United States government and they're still supporting him. We can't just dismiss this as ignorance or pacify their support for him by chalking it up to concerns about economy or inflation. Trump supporters are fascist. All of them are fascist. Every single one of them. If you are voting for Donald Trump, you are a fascist. Most probably wouldn't admit that they're fascist to themselves because I think that they instinctively know that fascism is a bad thing and nobody wants to see themselves as the bad guys. But that's what they are. They're fascist. And if they were alive in the 1930s, we all know that if they lived in Germany, they would have supported Hitler, many of them enthusiastically. We know this, but we tell ourselves pretty little lies to sanitize the odious beliefs of them because a lot of these people are our friends and family members. So we don't want to think that they're bad people, but it's time to wake up and see them for what they are. They are fascists, all of them. And they have no problem generalizing us 
So we shouldn't have a problem making a generalization that's actually accurate about them. Now, some of you will respond by saying, but Mike, I can't believe you. You're basically saying half the country is Hitlerian fascists. Is that really what you're saying? And to that, I would say, yes, that's what I'm saying. They're Hitlerian fascists, and I'm tired of pretending that they're not. It's important that we're honest about that because it's not going to change their minds, but because it should light a fire under our asses and get us to understand that those of us who oppose fascism should be mobilizing, should be doing what we can to stop it and not pretending like this isn't what it looks like. And it's more difficult than ever to pretend like this isn't a serious threat since they've kind of given up all plausible deniability. After we learned more about Trump's well-known affinity for Hitler from his own former chief of staff, John Kelly, he held a MAGA rally at Madison Square Garden, as you all know about, and that was incredibly reminiscent of the Nazi rally that was held back in 1939 at the same venue, and the hateful rhetoric that was spewed was certainly alarming for sure, but that's not the only reason why it felt so Hitlerian. But before we get into that, uh, I want to show you just a quick compilation of what was said, just some of the demagoguery, a small snippet of demagoguery that was on full display for hours. And we have to defeat them. And when I say the enemy from within, the other side goes crazy, becomes a sound. Oh, how can he say? No, they've done very bad things to this country. They are indeed the enemy from within. And but this is who we're fighting. I will invoke the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. Think of that. That's how far back. That's when they had law and order. They had some tough ones. Think of it, the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. You hear that, Mr. Speaker? Get ready. But he's done a great job, and he's going to continue to do a great job, and we like him. He's a terrific person. I watched him just totally decapitate a fake reporter on NBC, Meet the Press, Meet the Fake Press. She is the devil, whoever screamed that out. She is the Antichrist. I would just like to give the art world a little something. I got it here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Bam! We need to slaughter this other people. We need to bring a hundred million votes to Donald Trump. It's going to be pretty hard to look at us and say, you know what, Kamala Harris, she's just, she got 85 million votes because she's just so impressive. As the first Samoan, Malaysian, low IQ, former California prosecutor ever to be elected president, it was just a groundswell of popular support in a country that has been taken over by a leadership class that actually despises them and their values and their history and their culture and their customs, really hates them to the point that it's trying to replace them. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah, I think it's called Puerto Rico. All right, heck yeah, it's a cool black guy with a thing on his head. What the hell is that, a lampshade? Look at this guy. Oh my goodness. Wow. I'm just kidding. That's one of my buddies. He had a Halloween party last night. We had fun. We carved watermelons together. It was awesome. I just got back from Israel about two weeks ago. They love Trump in Israel, just so you know, they love him. They love him and Bibi. They love them both. I get back and they go, Sid, you want to speak at this MSG thing? I go, sure out of character for me to speak at a Nazi rally. I was just in Israel, but I took the gig. She is some sick bastard, that Hillary Clinton, huh? What a sick son of a bitch. The whole fucking party, a bunch of degenerates, low lives, Jew haters and low lives. Every one of them, every one of them. Look at my city. And the Palestinians are taught to kill us at two years old. They won't let a Palestinian in Jordan. They won't let a Palestinian in Egypt. And Harris wants to bring them to you. They may have good people. I'm sorry, I don't take a risk. They tried to jail him. They tried to bankrupt him. They tried to imprison him. And they even tried to take his life with not one but two assassination attempts. Now, you just saw a three-minute clip, but the entire rally was hours, hours and hours of pure, unadulterated fascism, 
demeaning and threatening political opponents, open racism towards Puerto Ricans and black Americans, white supremacists, great replacement of conspiracy theories being espoused, grievance politics, Christo-fascist assertions that Harris is the Antichrist, not to mention really interesting word choices there from Donald Trump. Mike Johnson decapitated a journalist. Another guy said we need to slaughter these people, but at the ballot box, wink, wink. I mean, they're not even trying to hide it. And the guy who mentioned Hillary Clinton was referencing a comment that she made about this rally before it happened. And she basically said something to the effect of Trump was reenacting the 1939 Nazi rally that took place at Madison Square Garden. And I am no fan of Hillary Clinton, but they all just proved her correct. This was supposed to be Trump's closing message to voters. He could have had an inspiring economic message and brought on surrogates that could have galvanized the crowd in a positive way. But they had no interest in doing that because the goal wasn't to inspire. The goal was to anger and frighten them into supporting Trump's explicitly fascistic agenda. But as openly fascist as they were, that didn't mean there weren't also dog whistles and Nazi symbolism because that was also present. For example, Elon Musk tweeted out a picture of this MAGA hat, which is the one that he chose to wear to the rally. And the font here is really an interesting choice because as Alejandro Caraballo points out, this looks almost identical to the Frachter font used by the Nazis during the Third Reich. And she also shared this Nazi publication for comparison's sake. And I've got to say, it is pretty uncanny. And some people responded to that by denying it and saying, well, it's not the exact font, even though it looks similar and the left is just splitting hairs here, except both J.D. Vance and Elon Musk have publicly denounced or made fun of this idea that Donald Trump is akin to Hitler. And personally, just this is me, if I thought that people thought I was a Nazi and I didn't want them to think that, I would go out of my way to avoid doing things that might make me look a little bit suspicious. But they're not doing that because we know why. It's why they use words like slaughter and decapitate when they don't have to use those specific words, but they use those words because it conjures up images of violence towards their opponents, which is what they want. Trump at a different rally talked about the press being the enemy of the people. So when you talk about these types of things that they say, the word choices matter a lot, even if they want to downplay them. And as explicit as they are, they do still downplay it, but don't let them gaslight you into thinking that you're being overly paranoid because you're not. Again, they've given up plausible deniability. So we work with what we've got. And what they've shown us is that they are fascist. They are Hitlerian fascists, to be specific. And this is why the 1939 comparisons are so important, because if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. And I say this because even though there were swastikas inside Madison Square Garden back in 1939 when they had that rally, it wasn't called the Nazi rally or the pro-Hitler rally. Do you want to know what it was called? It was called the pro-America rally intended for quote-unquote real Americans and not anyone that they deemed as fake Americans. And it was an overt display of patriotism with American flags everywhere and George Washington, and they began with the Pledge of Allegiance and eventually sang the national anthem, and they purported to be patriots who loved America. And there's more similarities, as Philip Bump of the Washington Post writes, quote, as detailed in Arnie Bernstein's 2013 book, Swastika Nation, the 1939 event centered on overlaying German fascism onto American patriotism, began with the singing of the national anthem, as did Trump's rally on Sunday, and as do many garden events, then and now the arena was also bedecked in red, white, and blue. Speakers in 1939 lamented government spending, railed against Marxism, and complained about how information negative to their allies was played up and twisted to fan the flames of hate in the hearts of Americans by the news media. Similar arguments were raised at Trump's rally as well. Free America, the crowd chanted in 1939, while Trump speakers pledged that he would save America with the 2024 crowd chanting USA. At the Madison Square Garden rally 85 years prior, Boone National Secretary James Wheeler Hill had insisted that the group's mandate 
mandate was to restore America to true Americans. Boone leader Fritz Kuhn, who called Washington the first fascist, meaning it as a praise, delivered with a brief interruption. The final speech of the evening at the 1939 rally, he concluded by offering eight policy proposals. The first three were explicitly anti-Semitic. Three of the final four were, quote, immediate cessation of the dumping of all political refugees on the shores of the United States, cessation of all abuse of the freedom of the pulpit, press, radio, and stage, and a return of our government to the policies of George Washington, aloofness from foreign entanglements, severance of all connections with the League of Nations. Eighty-five years later, Trump spoke at the Garden and offered very similar rhetoric and proposals. He spoke on the sixth anniversary of a mass shooting at a Pittsburgh synagogue, a massacre conducted by a man who blamed Jewish people for supporting unchecked immigration in an effort to reshape America. So when you take into account these parallels, along with Trump's adoration for Hitler and the policies that he's proposing, the picture becomes very clear. But you don't have to compare Trump to Hitler to make the case that he's a fascist, because you can just look at the criteria for fascism and that becomes clear in and of itself. But the warning signs for fascism, that's something that you should have seen a long time ago. For example, Reddit user FDT shared this picture taken of a sign at the Holocaust Museum that lists the early warning signs of fascism. And let me just read this. Powerful and continuing nationalism, disdain for human rights, identification of enemies as a unifying cause, supremacy of the military, rampant sexism, controlled mass media, obsession with national security, religion and government intertwined, corporate power protected, labor power suppressed, disdain for intellectuals and the arts, obsession with crime and punishment, rampant cronyism and corruption. I mean, they're not even putting a new spin on fascism. It's just traditional fascism. And if they check half the boxes i would worry but they check basically all of the boxes all of them maybe arguably one they don't check which is controlled media but that's a domino that is already beginning to fall because the owner of that washington post article that i just read to you jeff bezos well he intervened to stop the paper from endorsing against the fascist but you can argue that mass media can already be checked off since corporations own mass media and they would comply with the Trump dictatorship to avoid censorship. And I think that that's very persuasive because, I mean, just look at Mark Zuckerberg, for example. He's suddenly warming up to Republicans. And I don't think it's just because he wants more Trump tax cuts, even though he does want that. It's because we know that under a Trump administration, if he doesn't play game, he could get shut down. And these news outlets, they are businesses at the end of the day. The goal is not to inform people. The goal is to make money. So if they know they have to toe the line of a Trump fascist administration to stay alive, they're going to do that with no problem. So I think that we need to be sober about the situation that we're currently dealing with, okay? Over the past eight years, we've witnessed the rise of a national fascist movement. Ballot boxes are being burned in certain counties in the country right now. We're all bracing for another coup attempt from Donald Trump or his allies if he ends up losing. There are 70 Trump elected officials in swing states that are basically gearing up to not certify the election results. We're openly wondering whether or not the Supreme Court would steal it away from Donald Trump or if it's an electoral college tie, how Mike Johnson would steal the election away from Kamala Harris. So to say that this is a dangerous moment would be the understatement of the century. The fascists are at the gates, and half the country wants to let them in. And this includes our friends and families. And it may be hard for us to accept that, but we don't really have a choice. The evidence is overwhelming. If you're waiting for Trump to say, hey, everybody, I am indeed a fascist and will be like Hitler too, that's not going to happen. They're as explicit as they can be without straight up admitting that he wants to be Hitler too. But the one silver lining is that I will say, the last few weeks, it does seem like Democrats and the media are finally calling it what it is and calling him a fascist and comparing him to Hitler. The problem is it might be a little bit too late, but here's one great example that we're finally seeing. But that jamboree happening right now, you see it there on your screen, in that place is particularly chilling. Because in 1939, more than 20,000 supporters of a different fascist leader, Adolf Hitler, packed the garden for a so-called pro-America rally, a rally where speakers voiced anti-Semitic rhetoric from a stage draped with Nazi banners. When a Jewish protester rushed the stage, the Associated Press reported, quote, instantly, 
A dozen or more stormtroopers set upon him, knocking him down and beating him as he held his head in his arms. Most of his clothing was torn from his body. Later, he was booked for disorderly conduct. Now, against that backdrop of history, Donald Trump, the man who has threatened to use the military against opponents he calls enemies from within, who has threatened to use, use the troops to quell what he says are lawless cities, and to use those troops to carry out mass deportations of immigrants is once again turning Madison Square Garden into a staging ground for extremism. Now, that clip actually got a lot of backlash on Twitter, primarily because most Trump supporters are still in denial or masking their fascism. But I'm sorry, if you don't want to be compared to Nazis, stop supporting fascism. It's that simple. You can be redeemed. You can stop being a fascist. But once you cross that line, once you elect a fascist and all bets are off and there's no more controls, no more institutional checks and balances, you did that and you have to own that if you voted for this. I mean, we are playing with fire as a country and this nightmare scenario that we all feared would eventually come is finally here. There's a reason why historians like Ruth ben Gayed and Jason Stanley and others are sounding the alarms because this exact thing happened in history. The lead up to that thing is happening here in this country. The fascists are here and they're wrapped in flags and waving crosses as Sinclair Lewis predicted. I don't see how anyone can pretend like this isn't what it looks like or downplay this threat. But I mean, that's the situation. You can either choose to accept it, even though it might be difficult, or you can choose to deny it. But I think that you take this seriously if you care about the country or you reject it at your own peril. So we all know what's in front of us. We all know what will happen if Trump's elected. And even if he loses, it'll be scary to look back at this moment and think of how close we came to a fascist dictatorship. But if he ends up winning, buckle up, because it's going to be a really wild fucking ride for the next couple of years, to put it mildly. Mike. Is a total shit lip. Once he started chilling for the DNC, I stopped watching. So I definitely won't be hitting the subscribe button or turning on notifications by clicking the bell. No way. It's very sad, I know.